And, and let me just share my screen then. Which one do I want? This one. Okay, right. Can you see my slides? Is that okay? Yes, I can. I think we can. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me in Nottingham, um, even if a little bit virtually. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here today to talk to you about NICER. Um, NICER is the Neutron Star Interior Composition Explorer. Um, it's an X-ray telescope um, on the International Space Station, which means we have this lovely NASA mission patch, um, which I'm going to come back to later in the talk as well. And I said its primary goal is to work out the nature of the matter within neutron stars. So let me start with that and talk to you a little bit about the neutron star interior. So neutron stars are the, the dead remnants, essentially, of, of massive stars. The so stars that have started out with maybe seven or eight, up to perhaps 15 or 16 solar masses. Um, they've gone through supernova. The outermost layers of the star have been lost in an explosion. The core has collapsed in on itself, and you're left with maybe one to three, maybe up to even three solar masses of material, um, but compressed right down into a sphere with a radius, we think based on theory, something between about eight and perhaps 16 kilometers. So an extremely, extremely compact star, almost like an ultra dense planet more than an actual star. Um, in terms of the structure of neutron stars, what I'm showing in this plot is our kind of cartoon idea of what is happening. Um, neutron stars um, can have atmospheres of varying degrees of thickness, uh, but underneath the atmosphere, you have essentially, first of all, a solid crust which again is very unusual for a star. Um, that crust is, is a crystalline lattice of ions that progressively become more and more neutron rich as you go deeper and deeper down into the star. And the crust may be perhaps one or two kilometers thick. Um, between this kind of ionic lattice, you have degenerate electrons. So the, the outer part of the crust is really kind of white dwarf material. Um, but as you go deeper and deeper and you get towards the inner crust, Eventually, you reach the point where with these very neutron rich nuclei, it becomes energetically favorable for neutrons to drip out of the nuclei as well. And this is the neutron drip point. So in the inner crust, I now have still a solid lattice of ions. Um, I still have degenerate electrons. And now I also have free neutrons, which are likely to be in a superfluid state. And that's a whole other seminar talk. Um, you gradually get on going deeper and deeper, the density gets higher and higher. These ions get pushed closer and closer together until you get to the point essentially where they touch and start to meld into each other. And at this point, you've reached the core of the star. Um, what happens then? We, we really don't know entirely. Um, one possibility is that you have primarily nucleonic matter. So essentially, mostly neutrons, perhaps 75, sorry, 95% neutrons. Um, you'd still need about 5% protons and electrons in there for balance. Uh, but primarily a very neutron rich fluid. Density is getting perhaps in the, in the innermost core up to several times a normal nuclear density. But there are then lots of other very interesting possibilities. Um, the gravitational confinement in the star buys you a lot of time for weak interactions to operate and therefore to generate material that has net strangeness. Um, so there may also be strange quark material in the star as well, not just up and down quarks um, in neutrons and protons. Strange quarks may be locked up in particles um, like hyperons. That's one possibility that you have maybe 10, 15% hyperons of various different forms you know, in the inner core of the star as well. You can have various forms of condensate perhaps forming. Alternatively, the particles themselves, the neutrons, protons, and hyperons can actually dissolve into each other as well. And perhaps you have deconfined quark matter um, in the innermost core of the star as well. So lots and lots of interesting theoretical possibilities of what might be happening in this very neutron rich, very, very dense core essentially of the star. Now, here I'm really talking essentially about strong matter physics and also weak interactions as well. And that means that essentially we form part of a continuum and together with essentially our colleagues in physics of trying to understand the strong force. Um, so what I'm showing on this diagram here is my hideously oversimplified diagram of the universe. Um, showing essentially temperature on the y-axis, chemical potential, or, or maybe easier to think of it in terms of density on the x-axis, um, and looking at the different types of matter. Um, now, we and everything around us at the moment basically occupies this region kind of down here. Um, so kind of you know, relatively low temperature, relatively low density. We would like to understand essentially what happens as we go towards extremes. Um, so as we go towards extremes of temperature and also towards extremes of density. 
Now we have lovely theory, quantum chromodynamics, that is unfortunately extremely difficult to compute things with. You know, even computing from first principles, the properties of a single nucleus is extremely, extremely challenging. Um, so what we tend to do instead, we have phenomenological models, basically essentially of the particle interactions, um, and those we take and then we try to match them up against theory and essentially against observation and experiment. Now we're certainly not alone in trying to do that. Um, my colleagues who work across the road from me in Amsterdam on heavy ion collision experiments, um, also down at CERN, basically are looking at this parameter space essentially up here of what happens at low to intermediate densities and very, very high temperatures. You know, do you get, for example, a quark gluon plasma or another deconfined quark state forming? With neutron stars, we're actually exploring this region over here on the lower right hand side. Um, so very, very high density, but low temperature by comparison. Um, and neutron stars are really quite unique in doing that. I said they give you access to this region of, of up to several times regular nuclear density, highly neutron rich states of matter that you're simply never going to be able to make in the laboratory. And also the potential for stable states of strange matter, as opposed to very short lived states of strange matter, which you could form in collisions. Um, and if you work on neutron star mergers or newly born neutron stars, you can also extend slightly up here on the temperature scale as well. So neutron stars form part of a continuum extending essentially across to the heavy ion collision experiments. Um, and a lot of the theories that we're trying to test run across that whole parameter space as well. Now, lots and lots of nice nuclear physics, um, but I'm not a nuclear physicist. Um, so how do I, as an astronomer, go ahead essentially and try to measure this? Um, so I need something essentially I can go and measure with a telescope. And the technique essentially that we're using with NICER and a lot of the other techniques that we use all follow the chain of logic that I'm outlining in this diagram here. Basically, we have essentially, first of all, unknowns in the core composition of the neutron star, you know, this very dense material. Do we have just primarily neutrons? Um, how many protons do we have in there? Do we have hyperons of some kind in there with strange quarks? Um, do we have deconfined states of quark matter? Now, the type of particles that are there and the forces between them on the very, very smallest microphysical scale, those set on the larger scale, the equation of state of the matter in the star. And that's essentially the macroscopic relation between pressure and density. If I were worrying about newborn neutron stars or newly merged neutron stars, I'd put temperature in there as well. But thankfully, that is one of the things I do not have to worry about. Um, but in principle, you could also put temperature in there as well. Um, what I'm showing here essentially are some of the plausible equations of state for the core material in neutron stars that we're currently considering. Um, just to give you an idea of the range, um, I'm showing here different models, different compositions, your deconfined quark matter, nucleonic matter, um, hyperonic stars, hybrid stars where you have a nucleonic outer core and then a deconfined quark inner core. And the blue band is the parameterized family of models um, that spreads all the way across essentially this band here as you change the parameters. Now I still need then to get towards something I can think about measuring. And now I can actually make use of the stellar structure equations and I'm gonna build some neutron stars. Um, I have to use the relativistic stellar structure equations because we're dealing with very compact relativistic stars. Um, but essentially I'm still just balancing pressure gradients against gravity, picking a central density, integrating the stellar structure equations outwards and ending up with a mass and radius. Then I can tweak the central density, repeat the calculation and trace out essentially a mass radius relationship. And that is what you're seeing here over on this top right hand panel is the mass radius relationship associated with those different equations of state over on the left hand side. With again the pale blue bands being a parameterized family of models that covers this entire space here as the parameters change. So this gives you now some idea of something we might want to measure. If I can measure the mass radius relationship of neutron stars, in principle, I can now go the whole way back around this loop. So now I need to find one final thing, which are quantities that depend on the mass and the radius. And here again, I can take advantage of relativity um, because basically the mass and the radius of the star and their spin, and that they tend to rotate extremely fast up to several hundred times a second. Um, those determine the exterior space time of the star. So essentially, I now have the exterior space time, relativistic space time here. Any photon that is emitted from the surface of the star has to propagate towards me through this relativistic space time. And it can therefore pick up the imprint 
of the mass and radius in doing that in doing so. So what I want to find is an observable quantity radiation from the surface that picks up the imprint of mass and radius, model that and extract those, and then walk the whole way back around this loop and eventually give my colleagues basically in nuclear physics the equation of state and have them tell me essentially what it means. And that is the core of the technique that NICER is using, using X-rays emitted from the surface. So now is a good time for me to introduce you to NICER itself. Um, this is NICER prior to launch in 2017, um, in the clean room just before launch, and it gives you an idea, these are regular sized people, um, gives you an idea essentially of the size of the telescope. It's a kind of rather oversized American refrigerator kind of size. Um, basically it is a soft X-ray telescope, um, it's got X-ray concentrator optics, silicon drift detectors, um, and the X-ray band is about 0.2 to 12 kV, which is comparable to XMM Newton, but larger effective area, if you're familiar with that telescope. It's got fantastic time resolution and fantastic energy resolution, which is very important for the technique that we're going to use. This is also one of my all-time favorite pictures um, of the telescope because my, my kids are about the right age to be absolutely obsessed with Lego Ninjago, and when they first saw this picture, they were fairly convinced these were ninjas and were very disappointed to discover that they're in fact engineers and nowhere near as cool as they originally thought. But never mind. Um, NISA was launched in June 2017, uh, went up on a Falcon 9 rocket, um, part of a crew resupply mission for the space station. Um, and there's some lovely videos that you can download from the NASA site watching NISA actually being unpacked, essentially from the capsule and installed across onto the space station. So if you're looking for something to do in a coffee break, that's a rather nice thing to download and watch. Um, and the other lovely thing about having a telescope on the space station, normally you launch an X-ray telescope and you never see it again. Um, but of course on the space station, we can actually, we have cameras and we can actually take movies of it. Um, so this is an external camera uh, on the space station, movie taken in 2018. Um, and you can see NICER moving around very much sped up, I should say. Um, there are the detectors basically there or the concentrator optics rather, um, gives you an idea of the kind of environment that we're working in. Um, essentially, we have solar panels flinging to and fro, essentially in the background. Um, so we have to be a little bit careful with that. And we're obviously constrained to the orbit of the space station in terms of what sources we can actually view. Um, we're fairly close, essentially fairly low orbit. So we have quite a high particle uh, background to contend with as well. Um, because we're on the space station, we also occasionally have to contend with astronauts being out and around outside, um, and the telescope sometimes gets stowed, much to our great frustration, basically as astronauts are out and about doing spacewalks, and sometimes they pick the very worst times to go ahead and do this. Um, but it does mean we can also take advantage of the infrastructure on the space station in terms of the energy budget and the data transfer and so on. And I said it means we get to take nice movies of what's going on with our telescope. So to come back now to the technique that NICER is using. Um, so we're using X-rays emitted from hot emitting patches on the neutron star surface. Um, but we're also taking advantage of, of stars where that emission is not uniform using a technique called pulse profile modeling. Um, so we're picking neutron stars that are pulsars that have essentially bright patches or hot spots that emit. And so that as the star spins, um, the emission actually changes as the star rotates. So we take advantage also of information from the rotation. Um, and you can see in this little movie, some of the effects that we start to take, a, to take advantage of. Um, on the left-hand side, you see what would happen in a, a weak gravity situation with a hotspot. As it goes around the back of the star, the emission vanishes completely and we see nothing. On the right-hand side, you can see the difference that having relativity and strong gravity in there makes. Now we can see both poles of the star due to light bending. The spot never entirely vanishes, um, so the emission never actually drops to zero. And this is just one of the effects essentially that we take advantage of when we're actually modeling the emission from these stars that let us extract the mass and the radius. And in fact, we don't just use the overall flux, the overall number of photons, we also look at the spectrum of that radiation and the precise distribution and how that changes essentially as the star rotates. So essentially we're trying to model this, putting in all the ingredients that affect the overall pulse profile. Now, the particular type of stars that NICER is looking at are rotation-powered millisecond X-ray pulsars. Um, so these are non-accreting stars. There are also X-ray pulsars that accrete material from a companion. I'm gonna come back to those later, but the ones that NICER is looking at are not accreting any material. 
Some of them do have other stars as binary companions, and that can be useful because we can measure their orbital motion. Um, and occasionally, because they're also radio pulsars, we can track that very precisely. Um, and it means we can actually sometimes get an independent idea of what the mass of the star is, uh, which helps us also in our modeling to try and get the radius. The X-ray emitting hotspots are essentially coming because these stars have quite strong magnetic fields. Um, so there are particles being accelerated in the magnetosphere of the star, um, slamming into the stellar surface, essentially at the magnetic poles. Um, and this is a simple dipole field configuration and essentially heating up the magnetic foot points. And then you get X-rays emitted essentially from then, and that was what causes the hot spots and causes the emission to then change as it rotates essentially around the rotational axis. Um, they also spin extremely fast, which is good because we can take advantage of special relativistic effects as well. So we have several bright stars essentially that NISA can look to use for its data set. So how exactly does the pulse profile modeling process work? It has a number of different elements in it. Um, first of all, we need the data, um, and you're seeing an example of that. This is what we're trying to model up in the top right-hand side. So basically what I'm showing here, the colors are showing you number of photons or counts um, broken out by photon energy, measured in KeV here, and by spin phase, rotational phase of the pulsar. So basically we observe the pulsar for a very, very long time. Every photon that arrives, we measure the energy that it arrives with. We measure when in the spin cycle of the star it arrives and we drop it in a box. And then we just keep doing that for every single photon that's detected basically over a very, very long time. And over time, we build up something like this pulse profile. Here you can see you know, one bright pulse per, per, per cycle and also one slightly fainter pulse appearing here. So we have two pulses. We're then gonna try and model that. Um, so into our model, basically go all of the ingredients that we've talked about, um, the space time, the relativistic ray tracing, which is set by the mass and the radius. And then we also have to put in all the other ingredients that might affect what we see. So for example, how far away is the star? Sometimes we know that ahead of time. What angle are we looking at it from? We may or may not have constraints on that. How many hotspots are there? How big they are, what position they have, essentially what temperature they have, what kind of atmosphere we have on the star. These are all ingredients in the model, which probably we don't know a priori. So we're also trying to fit for that. Um, we then also potentially have a background contribution, which we leave free um, and let the model figure that out as well. That's our simulated pulse profile for a given choice of parameters. We then have to fold it through our best understanding of how the instrument responds to that incoming signal. Um, so the instrument properties become relevant as well. And eventually for a given choice of parameters, you get a simulated pulse profile that you can then compare with the data. Then we have to basically turn the handle multiple times, try lots and lots of different parameter combinations. We're doing large scale statistical sampling here and Bayesian inference from the model. And we, what we end up with essentially are posterior probability distributions for every parameter in the model, um, the mass and the radius, which is what we want for the nuclear physics, but also all of these geometric parameters, like where are the hotspots on the surface um, and what kind of size, for example, do they have? So now I'll just walk through a couple of these elements um, in a little bit more detail. Um, first of all, here's, some, here's the real pulse profile data. Um, these are the two stars that we finished analysis for so far. Um, on the left, PSR J0030. Um, this is an, an isolated pulsar. It hasn't got a binary companion, so we've no idea ahead of time what the mass might be. Um, two very, very clear pulses. Um, here's the, the pulse profile broken out, um, essentially by energy channel and rotational phase. This is the bolometric pulse profile up here where we're adding up all of the photons in a given rotational phase bin um, to sum them up over energies. So you can see this very clear double peak structure um, in the pulse profile. Um, this is about 1.9 megasecond of data, um, so several weeks of data. Um, Pulsar spins about 205 hertz, and the data set is actually built up over the course of about a year. Very, very stable, so with repeated observations, we can essentially go ahead and do that. Um, this is the second brightest source that we're able to do. There, there are good reasons why we didn't tackle the brightest uh, first, and I'll come back to that one later as well. On the right-hand side um, is the second one we did, and it's actually about the faintest source that NISA could really hope to get a look at. Um, this is 1.6 megaseconds of data uh, for a star that rotates about 350 times a second. Um, the reason why we tried to do this, and you can see the data quality is much lower for this one, 
but it's in a binary. And we know from radio pulsar timing that the mass is about 2.1 solar masses, and it is the highest mass neutron star known. And that means the highest central density. <laughs> so from a nuclear physics perspective, this was a super interesting star um, that we decided to spend time on. But it gives you an idea of the range of the data sets that we're trying to model. So now we come on to our, our simulation software. Um, basically, we have a, a bunch of relativistic ray tracing models. Um, my group uses one called the X-ray Pulse Simulation and Inference Code. It's available on GitHub if anyone's interested in playing around with it. Um, and then we use primarily open source statistical samplers like Multinest. Um, basically, within the NICER collaboration, we had about six groups with relativistic ray tracing codes. Um, so we started off by doing a lot of cross checks on simulated data um, to make sure that we were all doing the relativistic ray tracing correctly. We then come on to the, the inference part of the modeling, putting in injected parameters, trying to see essentially if we can recover those. Um, the inference step is much more computationally intensive. We're usually relying on supercomputers at that point. Um, and there are two groups basically that have essentially the computational capacity to do that um, in the initial analyses. Again, my team based in mostly in Amsterdam um, and then Maryland, Illinois team led by Cole Miller. Um, so basically we did again, a bunch of cross checks to check parameter injection. Um, and this is also something that we're still working on as well. So we have simulation and inference codes essentially to do the analysis as well cross-tested as far as we can. Um, and we basically, we work independently with the two different inference teams, both tackling the data and then cross-checking our results. Included in the model is also something about how the instrument responds. Um, NICER is perfect, of course, but our understanding of it is not. Um, and so there is a bit of uncertainty essentially in how the instrument responds to an incoming signal and what the real effective area of the instrument actually is. Um, what we do is we actually include this in our modeling. Um, so here is a plot just kind of showing you um, how we parameterize the uncertainty in the effective area. You know, it's most likely close to what the instrument team tell us it is, but it could be a little bit further away. And so we actually include that uncertainty in our modeling uh, and we parameterize that as well um, and try and fit for that too. And now we come on to the kind of the, the slightly more messy part. Um, we have to put into our models some formula for you know the possible sizes and shapes and so on of the hot emitting regions and so this is where you kind of stroll up to your local pulsar theorist and say you know hey could you tell me what range of possibilities would you would allow for kind of temperature distributions at polar caps and they kind of laugh gently and just say no <laughs> actually actually we can't um it's a little bit complicated to do there is now some very very advanced simulations of the currents flowing in the magnetosphere um, what you see here on the right hand side is, is a plot that shows the prediction of simulations of return current distributions, um, but it's not straightforward to model it and it's not straightforward to convert that necessarily into temperature distributions. Um, but you can see there's, there's a range of possible shapes. There are kind of, you know, circles, rings around them, possible crescents appearing in here as well. Um, so there are some kind of various different, you know, different possibilities that can be perhaps represented as simple shapes. So that's what we tried to do essentially in our modeling. My team picked one way of parameterizing this, the other team picked a different way of doing it. And again, we try and cross check. Um, so what we do is we actually start off when we're doing our modeling with, for example, a model where there are two clear peaks. Uh, we start off with two emitting spots. Um, we start off with a very simple model uh, where the spots essentially have circular shape. They can each have a different temperature. They don't have to be opposite each other. They can be different size. Um, but that is the kind of simplest model essentially that we try. We then run up through a sequence of more complicated models, allowing, for example, each emitting region to have a core and an annulus. So the core can be hotter or colder. And again, the two emitting regions don't have to be the same. We can then allow the core to be a little bit offset. And then we allow the possibility of forming crescents by having each emitting region made of two overlapping circles. And you can see, for example, in this one, if, if the red circle essentially had zero temperature, we'd be forming a crescent with the blue region. So basically we run up through this sequence of models. We have various different measures of model quality. As we go, we look, for example, at, at likelihoods, maximum likelihoods. We look at Bayesian evidence. We look at background predictions. We look at residual structure in the model, uh, really to try and assess whether the improvement is worth it for the added complexity. And eventually, as a result of this, we're able to identify a preferred model in our sequence. So let me now show you our first sets of results. Um, this is for this bright star that we started off by analyzing. 
took us a really long time to build up the data sets. Um, mission launched in 2017. We started taking data. Uh, this first analysis did not come out till the end of 2019, because um, once you had, it takes us about a year to build up a data set. We had to redo some of the data because we ran into issues with optical loading at certain sun angles. Um, then it took us a while to refine the kinks in the analysis process as we went through. But eventually we got our, our results out. Um, what we end up with an enormous number of corner plots like this one. Um, and these are just the probability distribution plots, the posterior distribution plots for every parameter essentially within the model. Um, and here you're seeing just some examples of those, for example, for the mass and the radius and the compactness, the ratio of mass to radius for the star, um, two dimensional probability distributions, and then also one dimensional probability distributions as well. Um, we then said rated model quality and checked that this was indeed the preferred configuration. One of the ways that we do that, for example, is to take the data, the best model that we have, and look, for example, at the residuals, just the difference between the two, check for structures, check that they're distributed as we would expect, um, but that's only one of the measures that we use. So let me talk to you, first of all, actually about the surface pattern that we ended up inferring before I come back to the mass and the radius. Um, because one of the things that we do, said, is to effectively make a map of where these regions are on the surface. Um, and this is what we think we're looking at with this star. We are looking at the star essentially from the Northern Hemisphere um, and the hot spots essentially are on the other hemisphere. And basically one of them is a, is a relatively small region, a small spot. The other one is this kind of long extended crescent. Um, the other team had a different way of parameterizing spots and came up with a very long thin oval uh, for this region instead, essentially very, very similar geometry. Um, and those, as they rotate around, give rise to the two peaks in the pulse profile. So one kind of interesting thing you can say immediately is, well, the spots are not opposite each other and they're not terribly simple. Um, so there is absolutely no way that a simple dipole pulsar field, which is our kind of canonical picture of what a pulsar looks like, is gonna work for this. We can very comprehensively rule out right now that this essentially is an antipodal simple dipole pulsar. So the magnetic field structure for this star has to be rather more complicated. Um, and here's one possible field configuration. Um, this essentially has a quadrupole component in there as well. It's a quadrudipole component. Um, and here the foot point structures would indeed be a kind of long extended region and a small spot. Um, also raises all kinds of interesting questions of, you know, can you still explain the radio emission from this pulsar? It's also a gamma ray pulsar. Um, so when we published this result, I was slightly expecting a bunch of pulsar people to come back within a few months and say, we can't explain the radio emission if this is what you've got. Um, but actually, the Princeton pulsar team came back very fast and said, no, it's OK. You can still explain the gamma ray emission and the radio emission if this is the magnetic field structure. So that's rather reassuring. All kinds of questions, though, now about how this field got formed and all kinds of neutron star evolution questions to contend with in there as well. Coming on to the mass and the radius, um, what I'm showing here are a number of different mass radius relationships, some of which were on the slide I showed earlier as well, and um, so various different theoretical possibilities. This is the result that we had from the first one. So the darker region is the 68% uncertainty, um, the lighter region is the 95%. Um, so we've got about a 10% uncertainty on the radius from this first set of measurements. And it's pretty much right in the middle of the pack. Um, it doesn't really rule anything terribly much in or out, but it showed that at least we could use this technique to make measurements of mass and radius. And again, what we're now doing is we're building up a larger data set on this star, and so those measurements will now start to get tighter and tighter. Now, we then had planned to go to our brightest star. Um, the brightest one is a little more complicated because there's also a very bright AGM in the field of view is the universe is messing around with us. Um, and so you actually have to observe the source a little off axis with NICER um, in order to get a, a good data set from it and not be swamped by emission from the AGM. Lovely star, because it has a mass measurement from radio pulsar timing, it's in a binary. Um, it's a 1.4 solar mass pulsar. Um, so we had planned to do that one next. And then our radio colleagues threw us this one. Um, this star was not even known about when NICER was launched. Um, it's PSR J0740. Um, and this is the one I mentioned that they came back and said, this has a mass of 2.1 solar masses. Brilliant source for dense matter physics because of the high mass. Um, so our immediate question was, could we observe it with NICER? You know, it's, it's an X-ray source, but was it bright enough for us to get a good data set? Um, and it turned out that, yes, we thought we could do this. 
Um, so basically, we dropped our plans to analyze the 0437 data set, the other source, put this one at the top of the pile. Um, in addition to the NICER data set, which we built up, um, we also were able to work with the radio team to get better measurements from them. So revised estimates of the mass, the distance and the inclination. So the angle we're looking at the star from. Um, and that really, really helps us essentially to get better constraints to put into our models as priors, which is fantastic. We also had data from XMM Newton, um, not phase resolved data, um, but this actually turned out to be really useful because XMM Newton turns out to give us a very good handle on what the background emission is. And it turned out to make quite a big difference to what we measured. So I'm gonna come back onto that in just a moment. So let me start off by showing you the surface map that we infer from this star. And on the left is the first one we did for comparison. So on the right hand side, now you see what we have for this new high mass pulsar. Um, so this time around, we're actually looking at the star pretty much along the equator. And that's actually why the radio pulsar guys are able to get such a good measurement of the mass for this source because of the fortuitous inclination angle. Um, and you can see again, this time we were okay with kind of just two relatively small spot-like emitting regions. And um, that seemed to be a good enough description of the data. We didn't need this long extended region, although it didn't change the result terribly. Um, if we had that being longer instead. Um, but again, they're not opposite each other. So it's not a simple dipole magnetic field structure yet again, although it seems a little bit more simple than the previous star that we analyzed, but potentially again, a complex magnetic field. Coming on to the mass and the radius of the star. So again, a whole bunch of corner plots coming out here. So let me walk you through what you're seeing here. Um, so again, these are two dimensional probability distributions um, radius, mass, and compactness, um, and then one-dimensional distributions, posterior distributions up at the top. Starting, first of all, with the mass, um, basically we have this prior distribution on the mass from radio pulsar timing, and that really doesn't change in our analysis, um, and that's extremely helpful, and without that constraint, we wouldn't have been able to do anything. So this was very important for dealing with this faint data set. We then started off by analyzing, first of all, just the NICER data set on its own, um, when we did that, uh, we got a radius down around about 11 kilometers. And then when we added in the XMM data set that we had for a joint analysis, the radius shifts up basically to about 12 and a half kilometers. Um, and you can kind of see what's happening here if you look at the compactness plot instead. Um, because what happens is you go from NICER, which is the blue curve, to NICER with XMM in, which is the red one, um, essentially is that high compactness solutions get ruled out. So what XMM is doing is it's actually telling us something about the, the baseline here that this pulse profile sits on. So on top of the pulse parts, um, we have you know, here are 9,400 counts that we're sitting on, effectively unpulsed emission. And there are kind of several ways that you can get that unpulsed emission. Um, one option is it's just genuine astrophysical background, stuff in the field of view, particles near the space station, um, just general mess. The other possibility is it can be coming from the hot emitting regions on the star itself. And if particularly if the star is very compact, you have a lot of light bending, um, essentially the spots never go out of field of view for certain geometries. And so you can get an unpulsed component by having a very, very compact star. With XMM, um, we are actually doing, it's much, much easier because it's in quite a different orbit to get a good idea of what the real astrophysical background is in the XMM data set. And so it tells you really this many photons have got to be coming from the star and from the hotspots and not from the astrophysical background, even in your nicer data set. And so it basically said to us, you know, actually you're attributing some of this unpulsed emission potentially to very compact stars and you shouldn't be, you know, it's genuinely coming from real background. So that's great. So it then cut things out on the compactness scale and actually changed the radius that we measured quite a lot. So that turned out to be important. And we're going to be able to do better in the future with that with NICER on its own, because we now have much, much better models of the background for the NICER instrument as well. So what does it mean in terms of our understanding of dense matter? Um, putting it on this mass and radius plot um, together with the other one, we're now sitting essentially up here. The uncertainties are about the same, despite us having a mass prior, and that's because the data set is not as high quality. Um, but you can see already some interesting things emerging. Um, first of all, you know, the radius isn't changing dramatically as you go up in mass, uh, which is one interesting thing. Also, some of these kind of equation of state models that give very low radius over here are starting to be quite strongly disfavored. So this will be very, very soft equations of state 
Um, and this starts to rule out, for example, some areas of, of deconfined co-op parameter space. Um, the other team, basically, when they did their analysis, had very, very similar results for this star. Um, nominally rather higher radius, essentially, for this star. Um, but a lot of that is due to slightly different assumptions about the priors. Um, they allow priors out to much higher radius than we did in our analysis. Um, and also, there are some differences at this end, although, again, much smaller, due to the way that we combined in the XMM data sets and the way that we modeled uncertainties in that. But that gives you some handle, essentially, on the systematic errors in the analysis that we're doing at the moment. And that's also something where we know that we can do better. Now, what we want to do, of course, is, is not just plot things uh, on a mass radius diagram and say, well, these lines go through and, and these ones don't. What we really want to do is to do this kind of next step basically on the diagram that I showed at the start of the talk, um, take our mass radius measurements and actually infer an equation of state. So what we really want to do now is do a second stage of Bayesian inference, basically where we roll back through the stellar structure equations um, and actually come up with an inferred equation of state set of parameters. So the way that we do that, um, we start with our inferred mass radius posteriors from the pulse profile modeling. Um, we then pick various different equation of state models. Uh, for describing the dense matter. Those have parameters, their prior distributions on those parameters as well, that it's important to understand. We then roll through the second stage of inference, we infer the EOS model parameters, we infer the central densities of the star, and that gives us an inferred equation of state model, um, so I can show that potentially on an equation of state plot. Alternatively, I can actually translate that then into an inferred mass radius relationship, so rather than just having individual points, I can actually plot an inferred mass radius curve. And that's what I'm gonna do in most of the plots I'll show you now, because I think it's a little bit more intuitive than plotting things in pressure density space. When we do this, we can also then roll in potentially other constraints on the equation of state, for example, coming from gravitational wave measurements. So again, there's been several groups that have done this type of analysis um, within the NICE team. The other team also did their own equation of state analysis with different models to the ones that my, which, that my group used, mostly in collaboration with TU Darmstadt. So I'm going to talk mostly about those for now, but plenty of other analysis have been done um, on this data set since as well. Um, so just to show you two examples, um, we picked two different equation of state models to get some idea of what difference that actually made to what we would conclude. Um, one of them is a model that's based on, on stringing together polytropes. Um, and it turns out that this piecewise polytrope way of describing the dense matter equation of state is a pretty good fit actually to a very wide range of more physical based models. Um, so basically the parameters that you're inferring are essentially the polytropic indices, for example. Um, and then you can eventually match that back towards more physical models. And um, the model that we use also takes advantages of, of low density constraints, things again from heavy ion collisions, um, chiral effective field theory developments at low temperature, sorry, at low density. The alternative way of parameterizing it that we tried was to parameterize in terms of the speed of sound, um, because there are some theoretical limits on how that should behave in dense matter. Um, once you pick a, a speed of sound model with various parameters in it that you're trying to fit, you can then calculate pressure density relationship directly from that by doing an integral. Um, and again, just to try and compare these two, and it, this speed of sound model is nice because it doesn't have discontinuities in speed of sound, which the piecewise polytropic model does by construction. So we wanted to try both of these different models. Um, so one important thing essentially to, to realize from picking your particular equation of state model is that even if you think I'm, I'm being terribly open in terms of what my priors on my parameters are, there will always be some prior distribution on your mass radius relationship just by the parameters that you've chosen, even just a uniform distribution of parameters. Um, essentially, your, your equation of state is pretty much a sum of uniformly distributed parameters. So you're always gonna get something a little bit Gaussian coming out of it. Um, so you need to know what your priors are to see whether you're really making inroads into that with the data. Um, so this essentially is the prior distribution on the mass radius space um, from the piecewise polytropic model and from the speed of sound model. Um, dark green being the 68% prior and light green being the 95% prior before we apply any astrophysical constraints at all. Um, so you can see it's already quite unlikely from the priors and the models that we've chosen um, that we would end up at very high radius, so we have to be aware of that. Uh, and this is entirely mathematical, not physical. So now I'm going to put a black line around the 95% region just to give you an idea of how things change. And I'm going to start adding astrophysical constraints. 
So first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to use the information from our radio pulse, our colleagues, and I'm going to basically say we know that we have a 2.1 solar mass neutron star. So essentially, if I go back here, um, anything in this mass radius space that doesn't reach 2.1 just gets chucked out straight away. Uh, and this is still the strongest constraint that we have on the equation of state right now. Um, so basically, this already pushes you straight away basically into this diagram here. And you can see now the differences between the two models. There are some notable differences because of the model choice. But you already cut down the parameter space quite a lot. So now I'm going to add in some different things. I'm going to add in the nicer, the first mass radius measurement that we made. And actually, I'm also going to add in information from my gravitational wave colleagues because tidal deformability on neutron stars that they measure for example, during neutron star neutron star mergers also provides a constraint on the equation of state. So when we put all of these things together, you can see if I, this is what we have before those constraints go in, things start to push down a little bit, basically in radius essentially for both models. Then I'm now gonna add in finally the, the radius measurement that we made of this high mass pulsar. So not just the mass now, but also the radius measurement. And our latest nicer measurement essentially now leaves us here. So what you can see is that the mass radius band is narrowing. Um, we can actually track that we are adding information essentially on top of the priors, um, but you can still see that there is a difference between the two models. So the prior and the model choice is still influencing essentially what we come up with. And this is therefore still something that we need to monitor as we add on further constraints in the future. But we're certainly narrowing th things down very nicely in terms of our understanding of what is happening with neutron stars, perhaps what the neutron star maximum mass should be as well. Now, what comes next for NISA? Um, right, we have four new sources um, for which we're going to be doing measurements. Um, one of them is this very bright source, which, which I talked about, which we're busy trying to get to grips with right now. Um, it's an amazing data set, um, but it's apt because it is so amazing, it's, it's a really challenging data set to model. Um, for this star, we know the mass extremely precisely already from radio timing. Um, it will lie somewhere down on this band down here. Um, so we're very curious to see essentially where that comes up. Um, I wish I had results to share, but inconveniently, the Netherlands decided to transition their national supercomputer to an entirely new system right in the middle of our analysis. Um, so we're currently waiting for them to finish that process and get it running again um, so that we can actually complete our analysis here. Um, so blame the supercomputer. Um, we have three other sources for which we're doing analysis, one of which, again, we have a mass measurement for. It's about 1.9 solar masses. Um, so it will sit up here uh, and two more stars that we're doing with no mass constraints. Um, so things will start to tighten in here. We also have extra data, um, particularly on this, this star down here. We now have a much larger data set here. Um, and indeed, we can see the constraints already starting to get tighter in there as well, which is also cool. Um, we have an improved understanding now of the instrument calibration and that instrument uncertainty, which the instrument team have worked on very hard. So that's going into our models. Um, we now have much better background models for the nicer astrophysical background, so we may not have to rely so much on using XMM effectively to tell us something about the emission from the star versus the background, which would be nice. And then we're also working now very closely with pulsar theorists on our potential hotspot shape models um, and taking uh, basic constraints and things from them as well um, to make sure that we're all consistent there. So there'll be more results to come. Uh, NICE goes through senior review, of course, in NASA in the beginning of the year as well. Um, so fingers crossed we get extended there too. We're also getting ready for the next generation of missions. Um, NICE is the first mission to be dedicated to using this pulse profile modeling technique. Um, but there are other types of neutron star, accreting neutron stars that also have hotspots. Accretion power pulsars, and thermonuclear bursty neutron stars where the whole surface of the star has a much thicker ocean layer that can explode, develops bright hotspots that seem to be a little similar to hurricanes. Um, those stars are really nice because they rotate a little bit faster. Um, and that means they have the, the special relativistic effects that we take advantage of are actually a bit stronger, so they should give us better constraints. Um, they're also rather more challenging in some ways because the emission mechanisms are different. Um, our modeling of the system has to change a little bit to account for this. The hotspots are not as stable, um, so we need to allow uh, for instability in the hotspot position in our analysis as well. Um, so that's now something we're getting ready for. We're also going to need different telescopes to do this. Um, we're going to need large free-flying X-ray telescopes, several square meters, ideally, to build up enough photons to do our analysis. 
A um, couple of different mission concepts being discussed at the moment. Um, EXTP, the Enhanced X-ray Timing and Polarimetry Mission, Joint Chinese-European Mission, um, basically that's coming towards the end of phase B in China at the moment, um, would be really promising to do this. Strobex, which is a NASA probe concept, uh, which was discussed in the Decadal Survey Report that just came out, um, which would also be several square meters. Um, NYSA is really pushing the boundaries on a completely new technique and a completely different way of measuring the neutron star mass and radius. And we've shown that we can do it, basically now with our analysis. We've measured the size so far of two neutron stars, um, including the highest mass neutron star known, which is already starting to put interesting constraints um, on the possibilities for what quark matter is doing essentially within the stars. And then I think the thing that I love the most about it is actually it's not the mass and the radius and the dense matter, which is the headline for the mission. It's the fact that we're making surface maps. We're using X-rays, we're using relativity to make pictures of where these hotspots are on these tiny, tiny stars, thousands of light years from Earth. And I'm, I'm a bit of a map nerd and this just, it blows my mind that we're able to do this basically with the technique that we have. But I think probably my absolute proudest achievement comes back to this beautiful, nice emission patch, which I have on my laptop, I have on my rucksack, so basically on here, we have, you know, the space station, the telescope, beautiful dipole magnetic field pulsar that basically we've now broken. And I'm really looking forward to seeing if we can get NASA to make us a revised version of the mission patch, based as a tribute to this horrible mess that the magnetic field now seems to be. So I will stop there and I'll take any questions if people have them. Thanks very much, Hannah, for this wonderful talk. Do we have questions? Hello. Hi. I, I have uh, several questions, <laughs> but I try to make it short. Huh? First of all, thank you very much for this talk. Uh, very interesting. Uh, um, you didn't mention uh, what is the range of, uh, I mean, the, uh, the bandwidth of the NICER for X-ray. So it's about 0.2 to about 12 kV. Okay, and, so the, and the bulk of the emission from these particular stars though is quite low. So we kind of model basically from, yeah, about, about 0 0.2, 0 0.3 kV up to by about three kV, the, the stars that we're looking at are not really emitting. Yeah, and and how much the, the, the uh, I mean, modeling of the, of the hot spots uh, depends on the which band uh, are you using because uh, especially in the, the in the different range for instance in the soft uh, band you expect a lot of absorption that you don't see in the higher higher uh, energy bands and the, 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 the properties that you should uh, conclude from the from modeling should depends a, a bit uh, a bit on the uh, on which band do you use uh, are you uh, do you use all of it or or somehow I don't know how do you how do you manage to take into account uh, different physics for different uh, different part of the band X-ray band. Yeah, so, so this is kind of thermal emission from the hot spots at the surface, and again, NICER is designed to be most sensitive, essentially in the, the band where these stars emit, because it's a small mission where this was you know the primary science goal. I mean, it does black holes and stuff as well, um, but basically running from point two, you know, up to 10 kV, whatever. I mean, again, by 3, 4 kV, we, we don't care. You don't see the pulsar pretty much against the background, but it's specifically designed to hit that sweet spot where the emission is for us. Um, now, there is emission from these stars, for example, down into the UV. Um, there is higher energy emission probably from the magnetosphere as well um, that may also be possible. I mean, New Star now has some observations of some of these as well, but the bulk of the X-ray emission comes exactly in the MISA band, and that's exactly what it was designed to do. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Li Jingshao. Hi, uh, Anna. Uh, very nice to hear your talk. And uh, congratulations uh, on the um, very good work that uh, you have, uh, you and your team have produced. So I have a question about uh, the hot spots. Uh, how do we know the hot spot uh, is on the surface, you, you know, it's yeah. not in a height of some, you know, um, 
not, not with some height. Yeah, so basically the, the, the model where, where if you assume a thermal thermal emission spectrum, I mean, first of all, when there should be thermal emission from where the return currents go into the surface. So again, there's a theoretical background for why you would expect thermal emission. Um, and I think the best I can say is putting a thermal emission model in works. I mean, we can satisfactorily explain the data using a thermal emission model, essentially, for these kind of the, the right kind of temperature that you would get from the simple mapping that's been done so far from return current simulations into hotspot temperatures. There is no other model, I think, where you would have magnetospheric emission right now, which would get, would be able to explain the data that we have. Now, that's not to say that at some point someone couldn't come up with one, um, but to date, there is no other model apart from the thermal emission model that would satisfactorily explain the data that we have. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ryan? Hi, thank you for the really nice talk. Um, I, so my, my question is in regards to the um, piecewise polytrope equation. Yep. Um, so when you eventually do get constraints and uh, reduce the region in the uh, mass radius plane, mm -hmm. um, do you know how this translates back onto the polytropic thing? Like, um, how, like is the core constrained by this or is the constraints more external considering you're tracking the surface? Yeah, so basically what we have is a pretty good constraint on the pressure at about twice nuclear saturation density. Um, the numbers are all, so the, the paper that is, is down here, Rymark et al, 2021. Um, it also, we, we looked at, for example, the dependence on different assumptions about the chiral EFT model that we were using. Um, and so we have constraints for various different chiral EFT models. Um, but right now our dominant constraints are about twice saturation density. So it is helping to cut down essentially the piecewise polytrope space. Okay, good. thank you. Any other questions? Hi, yeah, uh, so it's Jim Morris here. Can I ask you a bit more about the relativistic uh, effects that you're using yeah. to help with the measurement? You talked about the general relativistic one yeah. of being able to sort of see around the back of the star. You're also using special relativity. That's just um, um, using the fact that UV and IR shifted as they rotate around the, the star, is that? Yeah, so we're basically that there there are do relativistic Doppler shift effects coming in here. We've got we've got time shift effects. We've got light bending. We also take into account, for example, the oblateness of the star on the neutron star space time. Um, so that the model that we're using is one developed by Sharon Morsink and her collaborators, um, which is the oblate Schwarzschild plus Doppler approximation to the neutron star space time. Um, so basically, it, it accounts for a, an oblate star using some assumptions about how different equations of state give rise to oblateness. And that seems to be okay as a good approximation for the rotation rates that we're considering right now. So we take into account the fact that the stars deformed um, and then basically all of the rotational and general relativistic effects that come in around there and modeling that. We know that if we get up to very, very fast rotations, so if we started to get up towards a kilohertz, for example, um, if we ever find stars that rotate that fast, we might have to be a bit more sophisticated in our neutron star space time modeling. Uh, but for now, oblate Schwarzschild plus Doppler approximation um, is actually good enough for the, for the purposes that we're doing. Thank you. Any other question? Can I ask another question? Sure. Yeah. Uh, you, if, if, if I understand correctly, you, you said that the hot spot in this, uh, these objects uh, is uh, quite stable, but uh, I don't know, have you tried to um, other sources or these sources in, in other times uh, during the flares? Right, so again, the, these rotation power pulses, so the, the, the hot spots are coming from the field and the field doesn't change that fast. One of the things that we did do is divide our J0030 data set into two. We took first half of, you know, first half of the observation versus the second half. And again, you know, these are multiple weeks spread out over the course of about a year, you know, now a year and a half. Um, th there's no statistical difference in the data set and there's no resulting difference in the analysis that we would get from those two, those two data sets. And there's no physical mechanism that would cause the field to evolve for these kind of old, quite stable stars to change so fast. It will be different for the accreting stars. Um, so for example, when we get onto accretion powered pulsars, where's my mouse gone? It's vanished, right. Um, when we come onto accretion powered pulsars, which the next generation of telescopes are gonna try and look at, um, basically now the hotspot emission is coming from material being channeled along the magnetic field lines out of an accretion disk. 
Um, and so we know that there is some wandering of the magnetic foot point. We can already measure that from the data sets that we have from older telescopes like XCE. Um, one option we have is to chop the data sets up into short segments, perhaps 100 kiloseconds at a time, um, and combine those and assume the spot is stable on those timescales. Um, more complicated still, essentially, for the thermonuclear explosion sources, where the hotspots develop during a thermonuclear burst that lasts maybe 10 to 100 seconds. There we know the spot is moving on those timescales. You can see it shifting, um, again, in our XCE data. Um, so one of the things we're looking at now is how do we handle the fact that the spot is migrating? And that has to be kind of included in our models. Or we have to chop the data set up into lots of little segments um, where we can assume that the spot is stable during that segment. And I actually have a graduate student working on that right now um, to see exactly how we contend with that. But thankfully for the nicer sources, they are exceptionally boring. Nothing changes on the time scales on which we're observing, so we don't have to worry about it. Yeah, but, uh, but we will. <laughs> I mean, I mean, as you said, they are boring, Evita, because what uh, what um, I mean uh, would be interesting is to uh, to see the neutron star during the glitching or um, you know the, in the in the flares or uh, what is called the star uh, quakes uh, to see what really happens in the in the star, this would be very interesting, but probably it would not be possible with your with your software and the way that you analyze the data. Yeah, I mean, the, the, glitch, the glitches are very short time scale things. And again, we're building up data over the course of a year or two. Um, so, and also in the stars, the stars at NYSERDA is looking again, very old, very stable. They're not glitching, they're not flaring. Um, if you wanted to do this for younger stars, but again, then your whole magnetospheric emission model would change as well. The field is much stronger. Um, you'd have other sources of emission to worry about. So, so those will be far, far more complicated to do. Thank you very much. And are you okay taking a, a couple of more questions? Yes, of course. Yeah. So, so, so Yong Gao? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, yeah. So uh, I want to ask a question about the hotspot. Uh, do you mean that the, we only can consider the thermal emission? How about how, how to extend? Uh, I know some parsers have non-thermal emissions. So when modeling the um, X-ray profiles, how do we uh, subtract the non-thermal emission from the flux? Right, so we, we basically don't subtract it. Um, at the moment, we, we use a hydrogen atmosphere model. Um, to, so it's thermal emission through a hydrogen, or we can also try a helium atmosphere model in different ionization states that goes in there as well. Um, but right now, you know, we, we start our modeling assuming that the emission is thermal in the particular waveband that we're analyzing. So, you know, we, we do cut off at, at a certain, you know, waypoint about two, three kV, um, a non-thermal emission, which is typically much less pulsed. Um, so it's coming from perhaps higher in the manosphere or somewhere else we don't worry about. Um, if there were, you know, if a magnetospheric component or a non-thermal component were required, we should start seeing that in the model quality measures. Um, because again, I think then we'd start to see structure in the residuals that would tell us that the thermal model essentially is no good. Um, and so far we haven't seen that. Oh, okay, I see, thank but you. Yeah, I mean, in principle, you could add in a non-thermal component essentially if you wanted to. Um, and it's one of the things that we're talking about essentially for, for the JO4037 data set, which is fabulous of, you know, do we need to, do we need to add, for example, a power law component um, to model an unpulsed background component, for example, in the XMM data set that we're also joint fitting. Um, but certainly for the nicer data set right now, it's, you know, hot thermal pulsed emission. And then we have a, a general phase independent background um, that is fitted separately, essentially by the model with no constraints. So, uh, so we need to model the uh, uh, hydrogen atmosphere. To... Yeah, so we, we, we're using right now the NSX atmosphere model. Um, and any unpulsed emission from the star, which could include magnetospheric emission, would be folded into what NICER infers as the unpulsed background emission from the star, um, which then combines with astrophysical backgrounds. Um, so we basically have this, this free background. We make, we make no assumptions about what the unpulsed component is, um, and we essentially allow that to go in there. So unpulsed magnetospheric emission essentially would fold into the NICER background that we're inferring. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Anna? Maybe I will ask a couple of quick questions. Uh, one is in the first part of your talk when you uh, when you, you talked about you know uh, modeling the profile and then and then the magnetic field to reach the mass radius relation. 
how many parameters are actually involved in that modeling? So it depends on the complexity of the model, um, but anything from about kind of, you know, 10 or 12 up to kind of 21 or so at the moment. So this is part of the reason we use these simple parameterized models of the surface spot shapes is to try and reduce those numbers of parameters as best we can and to have the most general description of a wide range of surface shapes covered in these very, very simple models. Um, but yeah, it gets up to about 20 odd essentially for the more complicated shapes. Um, and then you're already talking several hundred thousand hours on the supercomputer to get that run done, essentially. Okay, thanks a lot. And, and, and my second question is about the second part. So, I mean, once you go uh, go backwards and, and you basically impose a boundary constraint on the equation of state, yep. is there some sort of in, in, in that in that you know plot where you see the various equations of state? I mean, is is there some sort of target resolution either for, from an astrophysical or a fundamental kind of uh, physics perspective? Uh, I mean, astrophysical in the sense that if I knew the equation of state to that level of precision, I could use it in another kind of you know, astrophysical scenario or, and, and, and fundamental physics in the sense of, oh, this is really what we're going for, because, you know, then we're kind of going to know something about. The... Yeah, and I think to, to really cut things down, I mean, ideally, you would like to know, you know, am I sitting kind of along this kind of line here? And, and to get to that point, you really want few percent uncertainties. But you also need to have a range of masses. And unfortunately, the universe has served us up a range of masses, which is quite helpful. Um, so yeah, our kind of benchmark is that ideally with you know, 10, 15 few percent measurements, we could home into being somewhere you know, around an equation of state like this in the middle, ideally. Yeah. And you could really say, yeah, stuff out here, it's, it's just not happening. Stuff out here is just not happening. We would probably, if we had equations of state, for example, where you had sharp bends or kinks due to a phase transition, you would need to do better around that phase transition. Um, and I think you probably need to do, unless you were very fortunate with the scatter of stars around the kink, um, that, that would be quite difficult to do. You'd need to do even better on those. But could I, could I suppose you kind of achieve the initial goal? Could I then to say, oh, I can now zoom in a little bit and create another equation of state which is very close to the first one? Yeah. And, and you know, so, so how how far, you know, you can play this game basically if you're and and yeah, if there were no astrophysical uncertainties, you could do it. However, there are astrophysical uncertainties, for example, in the in the spot parameterization. So I think we would probably run into that at some point. Um, we'd probably around one percent start to hit issues with our space-time approximation as well. But again, that's something we could improve without a problem. Um, uncertainties, perhaps in the atmosphere modeling, might come in there as well. So, yeah, in principle, we're just more photons, the uncertainty shrink. Um, yeah, you could just spend longer observing the star and build up a longer and longer data set, and it would be fine. But I think around you know around one percent, you're you're going to hit other issues in the model, which are going to stop you from doing any better. I think. Okay. Thanks very much. Do we have any any last quick question for Anna? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Again, <Go ahead>. sorry. <laughs> so many questions. Uh, do you see any uh, differential uh, rotation in the um, layers very close to the to the surface, if you like, uh, when you model uh, no, atmosphere no, no. and? Uh, not in these stars. Again, the atmosphere is very, very thin on, on these rotation power pulsars. So no, no evidence for differential rotation in those. Um, you might have differential rotation developing in the bursting neutron stars. So when, again, when we get to this next generation of telescopes, um, we, we don't know how hot spots develop um, in thermonuclear bursts. These are stars with a thick ocean, you know, several hundred meters of accretive material. The, the burning layers, you know, perhaps 10 meters down, or one meter to 10 meters down explodes, we get a bright burst of X-rays. It is possible that during that thermonuclear burst, differential rotation could develop in the ocean layers. Um, and that may be one of the things that's playing a role in actually causing the hotspots to form. I, I've worked on this for years and we've still got no idea what causes the hotspots, which is very disappointing. Um, but differential rotation might be playing a role in there as well. So you have something like convection differential rotation playing a role. Um, so that, that's kind of possible um, to have something like that. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so thanks very much again, Anna, for, for a really wonderful talk uh, and for answering all of our questions. And, and hopefully next time we can uh, have you over here in person. <laughs> that would be lovely. Thank you very, very much for having me. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>